Support for this program comes from Shell Point Retirement Community, a nonprofit life care community near Sanibel Island, offering lifestyle with life care. The City of Cape Coral Economic Development Office, Cape Coral, a natural fit for work and play. The Southwest Florida Community Foundation, helping Southwest Floridians to connect their philanthropic passions with changing community needs. And by Cypress Cove, a nonprofit continuing care retirement community offering lifestyle amenities, peace of mind, and flexible options in Fort Myers, Florida. More than 16 million Americans of the greatest generation marched off to battle across Europe and Asia to defeat the Axis powers during World War II. More than 400,000 of them gave what Abraham Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion. Those who did come home were greeted with a hero's welcome of hugs, huzzas, and ticker tape parades. It was like being a, in a war that had to be fought and had to be won. Then, almost a blink of an eye later, they fought a proxy police action halfway around the globe, only to be largely ignored by a nation more interested in pursuing the American dream than in honoring the sacrifices they made on the frozen battlefields of Korea, the Forgotten War. We were cold and it was bitter, but I'd rather have a little cold and bitter than fighting in a jungle where you can't see more than three feet in front of you half the time. And when they returned home after slogging through the rice paddies and jungles of Vietnam, fighting a ubiquitous, intractable, and all but invisible foe, they were vilified and spat upon by protesters as symbols of an unpopular war. Today, young American warriors are again coming home from combat, and again they are being hailed and treated like heroes by a grateful country. But they are often broken heroes, having lost arms, legs, and peace of mind in the turbulent quagmires of Iraq and Afghanistan. Every armed conflict, every generation of warriors has faced new and vexing challenges while struggling through the often difficult transition from war to peace. You change in war, just like when you get out of the service. You're not the same person that came home as you won when you left. You think different, you behave different. It's really terrible, you know, being in war all the hell of it, you know, all together. You, 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 you know, naturally, you want to come home and get back to life, but when you come back, Nothing is satisfactory. Nothing is fun anymore. When a person experiences combat, uh, the, the horror of it, and he comes back, he is in no position to readjust to society without major help. Powerful bond forms between men and women who face combat, a bond that transcends rank, transcends age, transcends even the wars that they fought. It doesn't matter what war you're in, we all bleed the same. We used to have a saying in Vietnam, we all bleed red. And uh, I think anybody who goes through combat and has to shoot at somebody and be shot at by that somebody, your experience is identical. Those bonds forged under fire can be as powerful and enduring as family. Sure, I love my family and everything, but people that you serve in combat with are just different. What they do and what we have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis makes them a little closer to you. Me and these guys I went to war with, man, in a lot of ways are closer to me and my own family. I mean, that's all you got, you know? That's all you got. One of you get caught slipping and the other one gets his throat cut. So you better be tight, you better be close. For many veterans, the best way to deal with the trauma of war is to turn to another vet, someone who has been in those same dark places. There is a strong bond between veterans, and I think that is uh, why the Vet Center program has been so effective. Veterans come in, they have a safe place they can come where other veterans are. 
they can talk about common experiences they had. I mean, Rob Zuccarino and Ryan Barnhart served together in Iraq. They were in the same platoon, fought in the same battles, and when they came home, they turned to each other, sharing a house, working together. You don't understand unless you've been there. That's why I come down and work and live with him. I know that I can look right over and talk to him, and he's on the same level I'm on. He sees things the same way I do. I'm fortunate to have a buddy that you know went through that actually in the same platoon with me that close that can do what he does for me. Combat stress reaction has been traced back at least as far as the American Civil War. During World War I, it was dubbed shell shock, believed to be a physical and neurological condition caused by the concussion from heavy artillery shells bursting. Later, it became recognized as an anxiety disorder, and eventually what had been called shell shock, battle fatigue, the thousand yard stare, was finally given an official diagnosis and a name, post-traumatic stress disorder. It wasn't really until Vietnam that people actually paid really good attention to what PTSD is now. Now we know from our soldiers, the more and more battles they're in, the more and more life-threatening situations that they face, the more risk they have of having PTSD. The psychological effects of battle don't always manifest themselves immediately. I explain to patients who ask me those questions, especially Vietnam World War II veterans, they say, why now? And I say, maybe it's part of your life review, things that happened to you that you never dealt with, hanging in your subconscious, coming out now. And that's how we talk about it. There's a lot of visual content that you just file away in your memory banks that you just can't stop thinking about them. You can try to stop, and all of a sudden, they'll just walk before your eyes like it was just yesterday. I was at home and my mother woke me up. She shook me by the shoulders. And the next thing I knew, I had her by the throat on the ground. And I told my mom, don't ever wake me up that way again. The other night we had a real severe lightning storm here. And uh, after about 45 minutes, it was really starting to bother me, the flashes and the booms, like the rocket attacks that I experienced in Vietnam. Even after 70 plus years, those nightmares can persist. In January of 1941, with war clouds forming on the horizon, 19-year-old Bill Larkin joined the Navy. Serving on a destroyer, he saw action in the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Mediterranean, North Pacific and the South Pacific. In the process, he had three ships sunk from underneath him and saw several of his comrades die in battle. At age 90, seven decades later, those memories still haunt Bill Larkin. I have a problem, I have PTSD, I'm embarrassed about it. Slam the door and I'll jump over there and don't know why, but that's very, not, I, <laughs> not very pleasant. Things happen. In 1991, George Tice's Army Reserve Unit was activated and sent to Saudi Arabia as the U.S. readied itself to push invading Iraqi forces out of neighboring Kuwait. Operation Desert Storm was over in a scant 100 hours, and Tice's unit never made it to the front line. But he was not spared the horror of war. A Chinook helicopter hit a tower and crashed near his position. When I walked up to the, the crash site, I found a, um, a gentleman laying face down in the sand. He had no pulse. When I turned him over, he um, didn't have a face left. I went inside and I observed a young man hanging from the wreckage. Um, the way he was hanging was almost like Jesus Christ hanging from the cross. In all, Tice recalls, the crash claimed the lives of five American soldiers. That experience left him scarred and broken. I have nightmares uh, at night from him. Uh, sometimes during the day, something will, will, will set it off to where I get a, a flashback of it. Um, the blood on my uniform, uh, the guy's hanging, the guy turned over in the sand. When he was a young soldier serving in Vietnam in 1968, Jim Marshall took a photograph that haunts him still 
more than 40 years later, a photograph of a young Vietnamese boy. There was this kid on the side of the road, and we were in a convoy, I was driving, and uh, I just looked over at this little kid that's standing there, a bunch of debris, bricks, stuff like that, all over the place, from mortars, stuff, and he just looked at me and he just saluted me. What haunts Marshall is the possibility that in a war where children were sometimes used as human bombs, he might later have inadvertently killed that boy. He didn't know who the enemy was over there. You know, he had kids that would blow themselves up right and kill you. I mean, this is the way the war was over there. In his heart, he knows it's unlikely, but the thought still lingers in the back of his mind that he could have somehow been responsible for that boy's death or that of another child. I was in Dong Ha. He was in Da Nang. So I'm figuring he's way far away, but it could be a possibility. You know, fortunately, I didn't have to shoot too much. I did have uh, an M79 grenade launcher, and when you shoot that, you don't know what hit. Jim Marshall says he's been able to put Vietnam behind him and move on with his life. And yet, he looks at that photograph almost every day and wonders. After facing the unforgiving reality of combat, many troubled veterans seek solace and peace of mind by doing what the enemy could not, ending their own lives. Every 18 hours, there's a, a veteran who tries to commit suicide. There are disturbing numbers. The suicide rate in the general public is about 10.3 per 100,000. But amongst the veterans, the rate is climbing. When I came home, um, I was hospitalized in the VA because I tried to commit suicide. Um, the nightmare is just was overwhelming. When I first came back, yeah, suicide was an option. I came back from Vietnam and um, I immediately felt useless, like I had done everything my country wanted from me and I was no good to anybody anymore. And uh, you stare at the, at the river a lot. I've heard of the percentages and, and the numbers, but at my vet center here in Fort Myers, we have not had a suicide. We're always concerned about suicide. As chaplain at the Veterans Foundation in Cape Coral, John Petruska counsels and offers spiritual guidance to other vets, but it wasn't that long ago that he grappled with his own demons. I contemplated suicide while I was in Vietnam. I did. I had been in country about eight months, rocket attacks every day, people dying every day. I literally got a Dear John letter. And at that point, I didn't care anymore. So I took my M16 rifle, I locked and loaded it, put a bullet in the chamber, <clears throat> brought it near to my mouth, and did not pull the trigger. Because I could not bear that my parents would have to deal with my death and I had not been trained to cower out of things. The changing face of war has also led to changes in the way the government treats veterans. Today's American warriors are fighting an enemy that depends more on hidden roadside bombs than on face-to-face -face combat. As a result, more GIs are suffering catastrophic injuries, such as the loss of limbs. At the same time, faster and better battlefield treatment is saving lives that might have been lost in previous conflicts. We have had uh, uh, quite a significant change in the type of uh, injuries uh, which are happening in the field and the people who are surviving as a result of those injuries show that there is a much higher percentage of people surviving very complex and significant injuries. The VA's response is reflected in the new $131 million, 222,000 square foot health care center being built in Cape Coral to replace the VA outpatient clinic in Fort Myers. Dr. A.J. Duan in Fort Myers says Southwest Florida veterans from all wars receive care there. With that in mind, we have uh, definitely beefed up uh, some of the services around traumatic brain injuries, and we are also looking at some of the uh, additional rehabilitation uh, options in the new clinic. In addition to the clinic, the Department of Veterans Affairs also has established a network of vet centers across the country to help veterans make the sometimes difficult transition back to civilian life. 
The way combat veterans readjust to civilian life may have something to do with what they find when they return home. World War II vets came home to a hero's welcome and a booming economy fueled by four years of war. Ticker tape parades, everybody felt good about putting their arm around a veteran. Virtually every American family was directly involved in the war effort, serving in the military, working in a defense plant, selling war bonds, acting as air raid wardens. Everybody was involved, one way or another. You're either working for the effort or you're doing something, you know. It was a complete, total thing, I thought, you know. Everybody, everybody did a part. They call Korea the Forgotten War, and the GIs who fought in that frozen hell were also the forgotten heroes. I came back, and I'm kind of walking down my neighborhood, and a bunch of people stopped me and asked me, he says, Where have you, you know, I haven't seen you in a long time. Where you been? I was over in Korea for a year. He says, I didn't even know you were gone. No, there was no waving flags, nothing. Didn't even know he went away. GIs returning from Vietnam, however, were neither saluted nor forgotten. We were all baby killers, if you remember, when we returned. Uh, and um, there were lines at the airport when you returned. You, know, you got off the plane, and there were people waiting for you, not to greet you, but to spit at you. When I came back home, I bought a knife because they were actually jumping the GIs and stuff like that. So I actually was more nervous here than when I was over there. At least over there I had a weapon. You know, I can understand why some of the old Vietnam vets went back and did a second or a third tour, especially with people spitting on them when they come home. And now, America's collective view of its returning vets seems to have come full cycle. As they were 70 years ago, they are again hailed as heroes. A lot of everybody was proud. We were treated well, you know. Uh, the way it should be. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were triggered on that fateful day in 2001 when terrorists unleashed a swift and deadly attack on America. 9-11 also triggered a torrent of flashbacks for many veterans. Just seeing the planes crash into the buildings are in our minds forever. Veterans that had those feelings stuffed, put away, thought they had dealt with them. Uh, when they see something like that, it triggers that adrenaline and those past thoughts and feelings that they had. Always on the news every day. 911 didn't help. Everything, every day on the news, it brings back a lot of feelings for people. Today's returning combat veterans can face a three headed monster when they get home substance abuse, unemployment, homelessness. Can't find a job. And um, some become homeless because they are using drugs and alcohol, or they are separated from their family, or they had no support. They come home, their money's gone, they didn't get a job now, they have no real career except shooting people, and they're not going to get paid to do that in Cape Coral. So what do they do? Where do they live? For some vets, the sense of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and survival is so deeply ingrained that they spurn assistance. Many of the guys feel like no one cares about them or no one understands them, or no one knows how to help them. So they isolate. It's very common from people who, after war, they isolate themselves. They begin to live in the woods or at abandoned buildings where no one tells them what to do or what kind of schedule to make. And when things get really bad, there is always the pal in a pill, the buddy in a bottle. The younger people are much more at risk, I believe, um, to use alcohol and drugs just based on their age alone. But you see also as people age, you know, ways to cope, ways to help them sleep, they might fall into that pattern as well. The guys found that they could use drugs to self-medicate their fears, quiet the ghosts, temporarily find some relief. Unfortunately, in the process, many of them were addicted and lost their lives. One thing that has been a continual problem for me is when I was injured, I was given morphine, Demerol, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and physically addicted still to this day. Drugs and alcohol? Oh, yeah. 
Hell, I don't think I know a soldier that don't drink. <laughs> it didn't come out in the service with a drinking problem. Well, yeah, it's been a problem for me too. The plight of the young vets is not lost on the old timers. You gotta give these kids a break. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take care of them. You, uh, uh, not be quick to condemn them because there's something uh, they may do or drugs. They need help with drugs. They need help with alcohol. Uh, and I have right in my own family, I have a son who was in the Marines. He's, he's a bum in the street. He's a bum in the street. What is it, what is it relate from between alcohol and drugs? He's gonna be 50 years old. I don't think he'll make another three years. No matter how long ago their battles, combat veterans carry memories they'd rather forget. For Korean War vets Jerry Montagnino and George Colum, it was the bone-chilling, mind-numbing cold. I've seen people take gloves off, put a hand on the skin of a tank, and it's 30 below, and they pull their hand off and they leave parts of their fingertips, you know, the skin of their finger on it. Cold. Uh, it was a rotten, stinking war. The stink of it, the stench. Anthony Biondi fought in the bloody five-month World War II Battle of the Hurtgen Forest in Germany. He suffered a severe case of painful trench foot, was moved to a hospital for treatment, then returned to the battlefield. I was going back to the outfit again. Uh, on the way back, they had uh, in one town all these dead bodies. They had uh, Germans on the bottom and American boys on top, whole big pile ready to be buried. It was an awful sight. I never even talk about it. Because it brings uh, old memories back. On April 7, 2003, in the outskirts of Baghdad, U.S. infantry engaged in a fierce battle with Iraqi troops and Syrian jihadists. Machine gunner Rob Zuccarino looked over an embankment and came face to face with 15 enemy fighters preparing to lay down fire at the advancing Americans. I guess I, if I hesitated maybe another second, he'd have got me in, maybe my team leader, but I, I cut loose. I dumped maybe 130, 160 rounds out of my 200 round drum on the trench. And then I couldn't even see most of them after the first few bullets come out the barrel because it spits them so fast it just puts up a cloud of dust. And I shot, shot, shot. And it happened so quick. That young man killed 15 Iraqi soldiers at one time. He says he remembers that and thinks about it every day. It never goes out of his mind. And that's what causes that post-traumatic stress syndrome for these people. They never get over that. So we send our young men and women off to fight in foreign lands, to do things, see things, experience things that no one who hasn't been there can understand. Is it fair then to expect them to come home whole and resume their lives as if nothing has changed? Those who have been there say it just doesn't work that way. All of these years later, after the war is supposedly over, it's never over for us. We're one second, we're one flashback, we're one smell, we're one thought away from 40 years ago. You change in war, just like when you get out of the service. You're not the same person that came home as you won when you left. You think different, you behave different. There ain't, really ain't no way to guide you through how to you know, readjust to the world. This is the world, that ain't the world over there, man. That's hell. And if we are still today reaping the bitter harvest of past wars, we can only speculate about the future price of deploying and redeploying our warriors until they have spent their entire adult lives in combat. I think we've lost over 5,000 Americans now in the Middle East since we went over there. 5,000 boys and girls, men and women, who will never experience their hopes and dreams. I think that's part of what motivates me to do what I do. Somebody's got to do it for the living, because we can't do it for the dead.
But through it all, and against that backdrop of pain and suffering and heartbreak and death, a common theme emerges among veterans of all ages and all wars. Mostly a love to serve, serve their country. Majority of the time, very proud of their service. They all come back and are proud of what they've done. And they're proud to serve their country. Good soldiers never ask why, they just go and do it. The vast majority of our veterans say that they would be more than willing to serve again. They would be more than happy to go and serve again because they feel like they're doing what's right. They're supporting the United States of America. I'm more proud of what I did there than I am of anything else in my life. I would not take it back for anything despite all the hardships I've had to deal with. Despite the fact that I lost two of the closest people I've ever been to in my life, damn right, without a doubt, without a doubt, I would do it again. Go to WGCU.org to listen to, watch, and comment on more veteran stories.